Kural MC dediniz. <gülüyor> Çocuğumla baştırım da. Bir saatle acıyordu zaten. Yani sizden aslında. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, we're going on our next session. The, uh, the title of our next session is Climate Changes and Urban Resilience, Strategic Approaches and Solutions. So I'd like to present our moderator, Mr. Tural Aliyev. He's urban planner and researcher at Iwash, Switzerland. And our distinguished speakers, Mr. Deputy Minister Elnor Soltanov, Mr. Luigi Cipola, Mr. Stanley Anik Bogo, and Mr. Marcus Appenzeller. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for introducing us. Dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. I welcome uh, you all, the panelists, this distinguished guests, the audience. Thank you very much to be here. And it's a privilege and a honor for me to be, to moderate this session, uh, which is entitled as uh, Climate Change and Urban Resilience, Strategic Approach and Solutions. As we know, the cities with their concentrated population and infrastructure are especially vulnerable to effects of climate change and environmental hazards, such as heat waves, floods, pollution, noise, and soil contamination. Urban resilience, which is an extremely important topic today, which is also addressed in the agenda of UN Habitat, Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development, um, can, can cover a range of aspects starting from climate change adaptation, mitigation, actions, disaster risk reduction, and so on. It also covered the energy security, engaging population and civil society, environmental protection in order to ensure the inclusivity and resilience in cities. Within this context, we will learn today what are the strategies to anticipate, prepare, respond to the challenges and disturbances related to climate in cities. We will specifically focus on energy transition, smart approaches for the mitigation of climate change, innovative energy solution for marginalized communities, and knowledge how to proceed beyond green strategies. In the capacity of moderator, before introducing our first panelist, I would like to thank to the organizing committee, State Urban Planning and Architecture Committee, and UN Habitat for supporting such an important event. Um, so we are pleased to have among us Mr. Elnur Sultanov, Deputy Minister, Minister of Energy of Azerbaijan Republic. Mr. Sultanov is also former, he former head of the Energy and Environmental Center, uh, Center of the Caspian Seas at the ADA University. Um, so Mr. Sultanov, please share your insights on transition from fossil to renewable, a key to resilient cities. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, in Azerbaijan, the 
policy framework that um, determines our actions, uh, government policies vis-a-vis -vis, uh, issues that are being raised here at this conference uh, is uh, Azerbaijan 2030, uh, National Priorities for Social Economic Development. I'm sure that many of you are aware of this uh, state program. So it is extended till its 10 year long vision on the development of Azerbaijan. And there are five distinct priorities, like five national priorities. One of those priorities, the fifth one, is called um, uh, clean environment and green growth economy. So that's the uh, title of the national priority. That national priority has two goals. One goal is about environment per se, which is being led by the Minister of Ecology and Natural Resources of Azerbaijan. The other goal within that priority is uh, called Azerbaijan as a green energy space. And that's that part of this being led by the Minister of Energy. Uh, so this is 10 year program and this 10 year program is divided into two five year strategy, strategies. And the first strategy, 2226, has been adopted by the government already um, with the detailed action plan. And currently we are implementing that um, strategy, five year um, long strategy. At the same time, uh, the national, another priority in the uh, strategic document, 10 year document, is called Great Return. It's about the um, internal displaced people returning to the liberated territories. Uh, and within that, there is also something related specifically to the Minister of Energy, and it's related to uh, the order of the President of the Republic of Azerbaijan. Because he coined this phrase, green energy zone, and he is ordering uh, to turn Karabakh, or liberated territories. Of course, in liberated territories, we have two regions. One of them is Karabakh, and the other is East Sengezur. To turn those territories into green energy zone. And we, again, it's a separate program. Uh, we also have uh, action plan, and that action plan became part of the great return priority. So what I would say is almost, uh, I would say probably about 30, 40% of the national priorities is devoted to issues of environment and green energy, which is somehow harking back to the main theme of this conference. Um, in addition to that, again, let me get done with the policy framework. I believe we have 10 minutes in total per uh, speaker. Uh, another thing is, after we established, we actually hired um, a Japanese consultant, TEPSCO, to work out the action plan for Karabakh region for the liberated territories. And it's being implemented right now, and I will go into a little bit details of that. But to get, to get done with the policy framework, the next move is Nakhchivan. Nakhchivan is the exclave of Azerbaijan. Um, and uh, because of the war starting in uh, late 1980s, in between Nakhchivan region of Azerbaijan and the mainland of Azerbaijan, there is Armenia. And because of that, they have been subject to blockade. But at the same time, Nakhchivan has very distinct features. The best irradiation, solar irradiation, in the whole country is in Nakhchivan. And also it's the only part of Azerbaijan that borders to Turkey, uh, which is very developed uh, power, which, which is very developed power market. And through Turkey, of course, you can get out, uh, get to other parts of European, to, to, to the other parts of Europe as well. Um, and given all these issues, Nakhchivan was also declared green energy zone. So to, to wrap up, for the whole Azerbaijan, for the whole of Azerbaijan, we have this task to turn Azerbaijan into green energy space. And within that space, there are two outstanding regions. One is liberated territories, and the other is Nakhchivan. So in a sense, these are the brightest jewels in the crown, right, of, uh, of Azerbaijani government. And to me, beyond turning them to green energy zones, it's about making statements to the entire world on how we are revitalizing our areas. Uh, after all that plunder and, and vandalism they have been subject to. 
Um, and these policies basically uh, cover all the aspects, of course, I'm, I'm the energy person, so I will be focusing on energy, and again, somehow I will try to relate it to the specific uh, theme of today's conference. So we are talking about all um, segments of the value chain. Right. So it's about production of energy, transmission and distribution of energy, and the consumption of energy. In terms of um, production of energy, currently in Azerbaijan, only the uh, installed capacity wise, only 17% is renewable right now. So we are planning to increase that to 30% by 2030. And I believe that we will go beyond that, because currently we have signed um, memorandums amounting to a little bit less than 30 gigawatts. And this is really big because in Azerbaijan as a whole, the total installed capacity is eight gigawatts. Um, Karabakh stands out in this process. Currently, in fact, next month in October, we are going to be, there will be opening ceremony for the biggest solar power plant in Caucasus. Uh, and probably, I think, even in the post-Soviet space in Azerbaijan. So we are going to be um, commissioning 230 megawatt uh, solar power plant built by investors. And I, I should also tell you this. I mean, in all these plans on greening up Azerbaijan, we are trying to rely on um, FDI, on foreign direct investment, as much as we can, because the state is busy with so many tasks out there uh, to which you cannot involve uh, investors, but where we can involve investors, we shouldn't be governmental, we shouldn't be using governmental money, and this is our philosophy. And we are very happy that this industry scale, 230 megawatts of uh, solar power station, it's enough to power more than 100,000 homes, right? So this is really big. Uh, the next stage will be wind power plant, but now regarding Karabakh in Jabrail region and the southern part of Karabakh is really good in terms of irradiation. BP, which used to be British petroleum, but as you know, BP today doesn't mean anything, anything specific. It means many things, many good things. So BP with its partners, they are planning to build a solar power station, 240 megawatts in Jabrail region and the power generated by Karabakh Sun will come to decarbonize oil and gas processing uh, in Apsheron, right? So Baku's, Apsheron's black gold is going to be decarbonized by the help of Karabakh's green energy. In terms of um, uh, transmission in Azerbaijan, the situation is not that bad, but in terms of distribution, there's a long way to go. Distribution of natural gas, distribution of electricity, there are a lot of efficiencies that we can really uh, capitalize upon, and eventually uh, any investment to that area would um, pay back. And for us, one of the best areas is liberated territories, because everything is destroyed there, right? it's also give, giving us a chance to build everything anew. Because reforming what is, has been already built is very difficult, it's very costly. But as, again, uh, of course there's nothing to justify the, the total destruction of all the infrastructure in liberated territories so far, but at the same time, if there's anything positive about that, that is the fact that we can build things from zero, from, from scratch, and therefore apply the best technologies. And in Karabakh, for instance, we are applying the best technologies in terms of gas transmission network and electricity transmission network with all the consequent efficiency outcomes. And regarding consumption, which I think kind of brings us closer to the team, main team of this conference about the cities, urban planning. In terms of consumption, uh, we already have um, bylaws uh, about energy efficiency in buildings. Energy efficiency law has been adopted about two years ago. Um, out of 14 bylaws, 10 already ready, 11 actually already ready. So in Karabakh, all the buildings are going to be built at the um, acceptable standards in terms of energy efficiency, which is very important because uh, the losses, energy efficiency losses, it's really about buildings most of the time, at least in this country, all over the world as well. So it starts with the uh, energy efficiency in buildings so that they 
are built uh, to the standards, and this is happening in Karabakh, in the liberated territories. But also there are many more other additional uh, policies that we're implementing, ranging from central heating system to solar panels, uh, to the use of technologies, uh, home appliances that also are up to the highest standards, A-level standards. And we also established a monitoring group to uh, make sure that all these plans are, all these policies are implemented uh, properly. And at the same time, I should also add that Karabakh region, the liberated territories, in COP27, it could have been COP26 actually also, has been declared the first net zero area in Azerbaijan. Right, for the country as a whole, uh, we are still making progress, but by 2050, the first area in Azerbaijan that's going to be net zero is in uh, liberated territories. Again, uh, we are uh, working in collaboration with other governmental agencies, um, and um, the building process started. Thousands of families have returned to Karabakh. Uh, we are uh, constantly going to the, those regions, monitoring, and we are so far so good. Um, but at the same time, I will finalize, uh, I think, my presentation with this idea that what we realize is greening up is very costly. Uh, and you go too green, then you have to pay too much. Uh, but so we, therefore, we are trying to find uh, that level of greening up. Uh, that is also economically viable, right? We, we cannot bankrupt the system just for the sake of going green. Unfortunately, today we have to import most of those technologies, right? And Azerbaijan is a middle-income country. Uh, so considering all this, so striking that balance between greening up, that acceptable level of greening up that we will require governmental expenditures, but to the level that's acceptable, and as a result of which actually eventually are paying back what you have invested is one of the major goals that we are pursuing as we implement this plan. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sultanov, for sharing with us your insights on energy transition, green energy initiative and policies in Azerbaijan, and with priority, uh, regional priorities. Um, I know that you have also another meeting and unfortunately you will not be able to stay with us till the end of the panel. Um, may I ask quick, quickly that you uh, mentioned about consumption and sustainable consumption is one of the priorities of green energy policies. How is it important to engage the population on that uh, initiative? And maybe there are any specific example that you can share with us on that matter. Thank you. Uh, so the price of energy, wholesale price of energy, is not very high in Azerbaijan. And I have to say this very carefully, because uh, being a welfare state, people also are sensitive to that issue. Uh, but unfortunately, we are not. Uh, there are issues to be uh, solved because of the price of energy, because price is really the greatest regulator. I, I'm a person who believes in the markets. Uh, I'm a person who uh, at least read Mr. Polanyi's book on great transformation. So market really can solve a lot of issues, and so we try to, the help of the pricing. But price does not justify energy efficiency moves at the societal level sometimes. So that's one thing that we are thinking about. Um, but at the same time, I think consumption-wise, as I said, it's about getting, for instance, in liberated territories, all the electricity will be produced from green sources. So there won't be any fossil fuel generated green energy. All the transmission networks, especially distribution networks, will be high technology. For instance, in Karabakh, we have 35 kilovolt, uh, kilovolt going down to 0 0.4 kilovolt. So this is the only area we are applying that system, and that means a lot of efficiency. In other parts of Azerbaijan, we don't have that. In terms of building effic efficiency, energy efficiency in buildings, we are much more serious than, unfortunately, we are in other parts of Azerbaijan, but fortunately for Karabakh. And also appliances and technology-wise, again, they have to pass certain standard level to be applied in, in that region. So all these things combined eventually, I think, will give us what we are asking for. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Um, yeah, again, thank you very much, Mr. Sultanov. Now we are moving to the next panelist. So this is Mr. Luigi Cipolla, who is joining us from Jakarta. Uh, he's a city planner and consultant working on sustainable urban development and resilient infrastructure for more than 18 years. So that means that he has a huge uh, experience and expertise on urban development field. He had also opportunity to work with UN DESA uh, within the different project in Uzbekistan related to urban development. And now uh, we would like to ask him to provide his um, expert opinion and presentation on two case studies that you have mentioned. And his presentation is titled as smart approaches for the mitigation of climate change and natural disaster. So please, Mr. Cipolla, the floor is yours. <clears throat> okay, good afternoon uh, uh, to all colleagues from the State Committee on Urban Planning and Architecture, colleagues from UN Habitat, and all participants. I would like to start uh, my presentation to give you uh, a short message on what was uh, uh, delivered uh, last year in 2022 on COP27 in Egypt. So one of the cross-cutting messages was to implement local adaptation and, uh, medita and meditation uh, solution and resilient infrastructure require a strong uh, coordination between actors at a different uh, urban scale. Also, when we see the 17 SDGs, almost 65% of the SDGs are addressed in urban area, are led by national urban development plan and are implemented locally uh, through uh, master plan and local development plan in urban growth area. When we talk in, uh, okay, when we when we talk about uh, uh, cities, we know that cities are uh, a dynamic and flexible uh, interrelated system of different urban uh, sectors. On the other hand, in cities also. Uh, are affected by the climate threats that can impact uh, the economic performance, the sustainability and livability. So what, it is, what is the solution? The solution is to adopt and then uh, to apply and implement a climate sensitive planning approach. Today, I'm going to present uh, uh, two of the projects that have been uh, uh, led and uh, implemented in Asia. And then uh, they all both uh, use it and adopted this uh, climate sensitive planning approach, but they have different uh, uh, contexts, climate contexts. One is the continental uh, and long uh, cold winter in Mongolia, and the second one instead is the uh, subtropical in Vietnam. The first one is the Green Urban Planning Project I implemented with the ADB for a three years program. And then basically they were aiming to uh, how to mainstream uh, climate adaptation solution in uh, uh, local uh, development plan and urban planning. And the, as you know, uh, Mongolia is uh, dramatically affected by the climate threats. I'll give you just some example. Uh, we have uh, land desertification, and especially we have uh, the cold wind that affect uh, uh, for eight months, seven months, extended for seven months in, uh, in Mongolia. And then also there is some problem with the flooding during the summer due to the melting of the glacier area. On the other hand, the most important message is winter communities, and especially in Mongolia, they spent 70, 80 percent of their lives indoor and don't meet, let's say, the uh, minimum requirements from WHO on physical activities. So the solution is how to replan and redesign the cities in, in a way that can be more uh, climate resilient. The project, the project uh, adopted a, a people-centered approach. It means that we tailor-made uh, identified solutions and strategies that were tailor-made on the, on the community needs. 
The project started, basically the process was, uh, first of all, we conducted a, a climate uh, vulnerability assessment. This one uh, gave a return, a list of uh, threats, and the threats were evaluated for different urban scale. And based on this one, uh, we identified 10 main key design and planning solution that uh, clearly uh, has the main uh, uh, goal to uh, tackling the different uh, climate uh, impact. I'll give you just some example. One it was uh, uh, using green infrastructure, for example, windbreaks. Windbreaks is very useful in this case in Mongolia to create a buffer and protection from the cold wind, purify and clean the air, and also increasing what is in decreasing the land desertification. Also, we're using some smart uh, land use planning, and also the way you can design your neighborhoods you can orient the neighborhoods, you can gain benefit from the solar path and at the same time uh, contrast, let's say, the cold wind. Uh, just to give you one example, it was uh, how to we apply this concept, we uh, design 100 second cities. So we know globally there is a movement about 15 minute cities, like starting Paris. In the case of Mongolia, it's totally different. We are talking about a climate that during the winter, the harsh winter is minus 20, and people can only walk for uh, 100 seconds or 150 meters. So we define and we plan, we define to deploy the cities in a winter and summer condition. In winter condition, the main social infrastructure are within 150 meters, and then in the summer extend uh, on more 300, 400, what it also we know from uh, international guidelines. So we adopted this kind of flexibility. And uh, second things, we also use some GIS tools for measure what is the uh, walkability and the permeability rate. And then, for example, the service catchment air. And this was helping us to define and to redesign the, the uh, urban neighborhoods in uh, Mongolia. The second project I want to present instead is how uh, again, an ADB project, and, and it was uh, basically how to uh, mainstreaming climate resilience and uh, uh, eco rest ecological restoration in uh, Vietnamese cities. Uh, the main here, the main tools uh, is nature-based solution. So it was uh, how to mainstream nature-based solution through uh, city planning. As uh, you already know, nature-based solution is very valuable tool for. Uh, uh, decreasing almost 30% of the global carbon emission. Basically, they only use carbon sequestration or carbon sink through uh, forest restoration, uh, restoration of marshland, wetland, and, uh, and so on. So these are very valuable tools. So the project uh, adopted basically the same climate uh, sensitive planning approach, starting from the analysis of the climate threats, and then we evaluated uh, the climate threats for four different urban components. Uh, it was uh, people, built-up area, infra municipal infrastructure, and social infrastructure. For each of those components, we evaluate what is the exposure of this component to the flooding risk. And this return to have a four different uh, mapping that were overlapped, and they identify some hotspot area where they, they say you have the most uh, a critical area where they're the most exposed to the flooding. So this was also helpful later on to apply some specific and tailor-made resilient infrastructure. The, so the project was implemented. We created a framework of different solutions, solutions that can apply at the city scale, uh, at the different also urban scale, city, neighbors, district, and also urban plot. Uh, the project uh, uses basically four main different tools under the main, uh, nat let's say, nature-based solution. They were uh, uh, gray to green. They were bioengineering solution for the river bank restoration, WSUD, that is water-sensitive urban design to reducing and catching uh, the runoff in urban area. Uh, just to present one solution, it was basically the renovation and then uh, and the conversion of uh, existing uh, gray embankment for a river bank. So we adopted uh, basically a new nature-based solution using uh, valuable tools like a food plane. Food plane is a valuable tool for catching, uh, let's say, the runoff from uh, the upstream basin 
and also to increasing the storage capacity for uh, the runoff, also increasing soil permeability and so on, and also creating space, biodiversity, and space for social uh, connectivity. Uh, the project also uh, adopted other tools, like uh, all the tools that we're using for uh, urban area, like uh, constructed wetland, bioretention, and so on. Uh, this is just an example from Asia. I, wa I want to just conclude my presentation. Okay. Just to give you, uh, basically, now is the, is, is the time for calling for action. When we're talking about action, I want just to mention three different factors. The first one, about social aspect, about the climate change, climate justice. Uh, we, we know that climate disruption and climate impact 15 times is more higher in vulnerable region in the last 10 decades. Second uh, is an aspect about technical. Uh, in my experience, th in these projects are all implemented. They are very long projects. They, you need a strong capacity building program to train the local, uh, um, local municipality and also passing the, the different climate adaptation and, uh, and technical skills on different expertise at a local level. And the most important, uh, through this project, we upgraded 10 uh, technical standards and norms, they are already in place because we found that when you go to the procurement and in, contract, in a contractual stage, private sector developer cannot implement those solutions if you don't have all the norms and standards upgraded. The last uh, message is, uh, is economic and financial. We already know that we have in place a lot of uh, public finance climate investment, so only to give you some global sustainable bond market from UN Global Compact and the green and blue bond framework. Uh, we have a carbon trading scheme and grant mechanism. As everything is in place, is already available, so it's uh, just the time on action for implementing uh, those projects and making our city more resilient, sustainable, and uh, also livable for our citizens. Thank you very much, and uh, I'm happy to reply to any and, uh, question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sipola. It was indeed very fascinating, two projects that you have presented to us, two different projects um, in two different extreme weather conditions, context, and you have provided one from Mongolia, one from Vietnam, and we saw also the specific context of these countries and how urban planners actually should provide planning or replanning, taking into account the climate uh, context of specific cities. Um, you have also mentioned about nature-based solutions um, on the riverbank, retrofitting projects, and um, indeed it's, it was very fascinating. And uh, in the capacity of moderator, if I may to ask you, um, artificial intelligence, in the nature-based solution, how do you combine these elements in order to reinforce urban resilience in cities? Thank you very much for your question. Uh, artificial intelligence can be uh, adopted uh, for, uh, the, the generally for the, uh, tackling climate change. Uh, I'll give you just some example. Uh, for example, for other projects, artificial intelligence can help to uh, in the case of uh, uh, municipal infrastructure and solid waste management, for example, to using some tools that can improve in uh, what is the, the waste track uh, route uh, planning, basically to optimize the route for, uh, for example, reducing time, optimize cost and reducing carbon emission, that track can spend a lot of time for collecting the waste. On the other hand, also artificial intelligence can quickly identify that by analyzing uh, historical satellite image can identify when, uh, for example, your coast <clears throat> or, for example, your coastal reef or mangroves area. I'm talking, I'm uh, working and based in Indonesia, in Jakarta, and there is more than 60% of the population living in coastal area. So it's very effective if you can identify that having a threshold, an alert that can tell you that uh, uh, through artificial intelligence can identify when the coast erosion is more significant in some area rather than others. And uh, also, in based on natural-based solution, but also related to the water uh, consumption, we know that uh, agriculture consumes 70% of our 
uh, is more responsible for cons uh, water consumption for the 70%. And then we know that 40% is lost due to uh, low uh, performance. And there is uh, some tools that can help you to manage them better and to identify from different pattern, different uh, uh, situation to uh, change the condition and to, and to administrate what is the main uh, uh, smart irrigation system or apply smart irrigation system. So these things uh, uh, can be really helpful to process a large amount of data and uh, give you suggestions and comments, uh, let's say uh, alerting you as an expert on what are the main uh, issues and problems. And then it's, it's our task to apply action. Thank you. Thank you for insights as an urban planner that you provided for us, which is in relation to IT and also nature-based solutions. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, now we are moving to, the, to our next panelist. Uh, this is Mr. Stanley Anikboko. He's joining us from Africa. Mr. Anikboko is the CEO of the company, private company, uh, Lighted. This company is uh, recycles electrical and electronic waste to provide energy solutions to rural families. So he will share, share his insights on that topic and his presentation is titled Innovative Energy Solutions Empowering Marginalized Communities Amid Urban Climate Challenges. So please, the floor is yours. Yeah. Hello. Oh. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Stanley Anibog. Super excited to be here. Um, and today I'm going to be talking on about my work and my organization's work in providing um, marginalized communities access to clean and affordable energy. Um, first of all, we would look at the effects of energy challenge and how it affects these communities. Um, most of these communities rely on the alternative um, sources of energy that we, our ancestors used during the Ice Age, which is candles, grazing lamps, and oil lamps. And um, surprisingly, in, in a world where technology is rapidly advancing with AI, machine learning, so much technology, there are people still using candles and grazing lamps all across the world, not only in Africa. And in Africa, you have 759 million people that do not have access to a single volt of electricity. And we often overlook those um, people or those communities because we think they do not affect or contribute to climate change, but they do. Um, just lighting up uh, 190 million crazing lamps every day is equivalent to 50 um, fossil plants. And um, we see that they contribute at a very large amount. And having a continent with 70, 759 million people, that's a lot. And, sorry. And um, this affects them in so many different ways that we can't even tell. But I will go to the surface um, where I also am a victim of this problem. So I spent 11 years of my life using candles and crazy lamps. And um, at the moment, I, <laughs> I do not use body spray because when I use body spray, I have this allergic reaction, but I still smell nice. Um, the truth is, so many kids in Africa still use these solutions, and some of them might be asthmatic or have respiratory problems, but they still have to use it in order to study at night. So in Africa, when the sun goes down, it's actually a bad story for a lot of families. So. What we do is we leverage on innovative design principles to repurpose um, material waste. So during, um, before I started my startup, um, we tried to produce our solutions locally, and we didn't have access to the materials. Shipping them in from China cost us um, a lot of money during our first um, phase of production. And what we did is we started looking at alternative ways we can produce our products and get the electronics components locally. And we found out that majority of the electronic waste from desktops to laptops 
that are used in Europe, in America, are shipped down, sorry, are shipped down into Africa. So we leveraged on those electronic components and designed our inverter systems in our products, and that in turn stores energy from solar panels and provides it for these families. And most of our, most of our solutions are designed in a way that we work with these communities. We do not design by ourselves. So we design with, majority of our users are kids because we want to provide them access to clean energy to study at night. And we work with them in the design process. Working with kids is super fun because they do not have any limitation in the way they think. And that allows us to explore um, ideas that we often think that are not possible, but when we break them down, we find um, some of them possible. The girl in the center is holding a lamp made out of a plastic bottle, um, recycled. Um, the 3D printed parts are also printed out of recycled um, plastic bottles and plastic pellets. And um, the lamps are also made out of um, recycled lithium ion batteries and the diodes are gotten from recycled laptops and um, desktops. Um, we leverage on waste, um, but we do not handle the entire process. We work around a system that is already existing and some of these systems are, you can find the man in the middle, he deals electronic waste components. They actually sell some of these second value electronics. So what we did is we looked at the most available. If we are to produce one million of our products, would these materials be available for us? And we found those key materials, making our product at least 60% of our product made out of electronic waste or components we can get from electronic waste. And we work with the electronic waste recyclers to collect this waste in the process of our production. And we've done projects in Nigeria and um, also in Morocco, in the Atlas Mountain. We implemented a project that was funded um, by some NGOs in Morocco. And the environmental benefit of this is it helps these families shift from uh, the toxic um, fossil fuel solu um, solutions that they are using into a greener solution. But not only that, a family spends up to um, $5 a week to afford kerosene lamps, and the current price of kerosene in Nigeria is currently rising. And with this, with our solution, they just only have to um, charge for five cents in a week. And we're helping them save a lot of money for these families that earn roughly one to seven dollars in a single day. And that is what we are trying to do, help them economically, socially, but also environmentally. Um, for 2022, um, we have not concluded our report for 2023. So for 2022, we have provided um, 70,000 families and people, individuals, access to energy, and that spreads across um, some of our projects. Um, we have our Light for Peace project, where we work with IDP camps in Nigeria, and we provide these IDP camps access to energy because these IDP camps are created out of the conflicts that happen in Nigeria. And most of these people live in clumps and communities, and those are gated communities. So what we do is we install charging stations in these communities for them to go and charge, and we provide them access to the lamps. And we do training for kids. So what we do is we provide them access to lamps, and the kids actually build the lamps themselves. So we designed it in a way it's like a Lego set, and each kid has the ability to create their own lamp, with the components that we bring to the table. And in that way, because we designed it with the kids, it gave us the experience to understand what they want, how they can be part of that process, and giving them ownership of the solution as well. Um, the social and environmental impact of our work is, um, I've also touched on this, providing them access to clean energy, recycling um, electronics and plastic bottles um, is also helping to contribute in so many different ways and also help improve their health, uh, educational op opportunity, and um, improve their livelihoods. Um, the future direction that we're heading into, this is our very first prototype of uh, an outdoor charging station. Um, we are planning in the next few months with 
um, support from um, different organizations like Amazon and um, Swarovski Foundation, we are designing new spaces that allows communities to interact with energy. Um, this is a very first model um, that was done a few months ago, but we're looking forward to developing this and seeing how we can design energy solutions that cost less, but allows people to have access to basic lighting. Um, we cannot provide them access to energy to heat up their homes or cook their meals, but we believe um, solving um, the problem of access to clean lightning would be able to help these um, families. And thank you very much and for listening to my presentation. And I'm um, looking forward to keep on playing our role in the providing families access to clean and affordable energy. Thank you. Thank you very much for an interesting and fascinating presentation from the ground with a specific local context. And uh, the, the main messages here that we saw how uh, you engage also a social uh, aspect of urban resilience, I mean, a population into uh, in, in enhancing urban resilience in cities, which is uh, uh, one of the important pillars of urban resilience in cities. Um, Within that, I would like also to ask you, what is your um, collaboration or um, collaboration framework with other entities such as public sphere, NGOs, how they are involved in your project? Um, so when, when we deploy projects, we work with um, a three month um, goal plan and we find an, a, a community um, we map the number, the population that do not have access because even in a community where you have up to 6,000 people without access to energy, you have uh, a couple of hundred, maybe 300 people that were able to afford maybe small solar panels. So what we do is we work with organizations to do the mapping. Then we look at the community we are working with. We have done implementations that um, compromises of schools um, with this children with disabilities. So what we do is we work with a local organization that works with kids that have disability because I might have um, experience in designing and prototyping, but I do not have experience um, discussing with kids with disability. So we work with these organizations. Working in the refugee situation, we work with um, local partners. Then when it comes to international partners, most of them are around funding the projects or providing us expertise around team building and team management, so um, that's how we do it. And um, sometimes we have worked with the local government in Nigeria in a local community that had um, the flooding issue that happened in Nigeria, in Anambra State. We worked with the local um, community and uh, they helped us in with funding to map out a specific camp and install street lights around those areas and provide those um, families access to rechargeable lamps that they could use during that period of um, migrating into a new space. Thank you very much. And we saw from your presentation how um, environmental, socially, and the societies can get benefits and what are the tangible results of these practical examples within the specific case. Thank you very much. Now we are moving to our last uh, panelist. This is Mr. Marcus Appenzeller, who is a founder and partner, MLA Plus, who is joining us from Amsterdam. He is also Dean of Urbanism, Amsterdam Academy of Architecture, uh, and he's joining us from Netherlands. And uh, Mr. Appenzeller, um, is working in the private sector for a long time in architecture, landscape, planning fields, um, and uh, focusing in big questions such as related to cities, urbanization, regeneration, housing, climate change, uh, resulting necessary adjustment to the way we live. So Mr. Appenzell's presentation will be focusing on Bayonne Green, beyond green opportunities and challenges. So please share your insights, what we should take into account 
beyond the greening aspect in cities to make them more resilient. The floor is yours. Thank you. This is, yeah. Working. Thank you very much. Um, I um, titled my um, uh, presentation Beyond Nice Green, because I think it still involves green. Um, uh, but um, I think it's more uh, than that what we need to look at. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we have a problem. Um, and that problem actually has a color. It's blue. Actually, most of the time it's not blue, it's actually brown. And I brought you just a little um, movie of um, Thanks to UN Habitat, a summary of one week uh, of uh, uh, flooding disasters. That was two weeks ago. Um, today we could add flooding uh, again, in Greece, uh, we can add flooding um, in, in New York just uh, yesterday, so it becomes a bigger and bigger and bigger problem. Also, just the extreme um, um, condition that we have. Uh, a similar film you could make not only about flooding, but also about drought, about uh, forest fires, uh, etc. And um, um, that also, as planners, of course, worries us, because we are kind of concerned about cities uh, and what to do with them. Uh, and we need to come up uh, with solutions uh, for that. Uh, it can continue on and on and on. Um, but the problem we simply have is that we ourselves as mankind have unleashed natural forces that cannot be kept in check anymore. We've reached a point where it just gets too much. But that also means that the small incremental changes we were hoping for, planting a tree here, making a little uh, water retention pond there, is actually just not enough anymore. We have to step our game. We have to change our game. We have to um, uh, develop, start developing comp comprehensive solutions that look at the problem uh, and not just uh, you know, patching uh, a bit uh, here and there. Now, um, luckily, um, there is a, a change going on, also change in thinking, um, which I always describe going from ego to eco, so in a way moving um, a sort of a, a, a development ideal where you know, a human being is at the top towards a development model where the human being is part of an ecosystem, but that also includes other animals, that includes plants, and we can actually use that as an opportunity. And uh, you've introduced me as coming from Amsterdam, which is in the Netherlands. Um, you know, in the past we did these kinds of things, uh, which is actually not a comprehensive solution because it's actually purely focused on what humans need. Nature did not play a role in that. There's a bit of green here, but most of it is actually, uh, is actually concrete, and most of it leads to um, less biodiversity um, uh, and a, a less, um, you know, ecosystems that work uh, much less good than they would if we use uh, different solutions. But we also have a solution that is interestingly also, in this case, blue, and also a bit of green. I'm mainly talking about the blue today, but um, the green is uh, equally important uh, in that. Um, I want to take you to uh, Indonesia, to a project uh, my company has been working on uh, as part of a program by the Dutch government uh, called Water as Leverage. Uh, we looked at the city of Semarang, which is one of the big cities uh, in Indonesia, uh, which actually has a big um, and quite typical problem. So it is located at the sea, um, has quite high mountains in the back. Uh, half, half, half of the year it actually has too much water and the other half of the year it has uh, too little water. With the systems that have in place, when it's raining heavily, all the water is basically channeled into the sea. Um, you get the water out of the city as quick as possible, but then when the drought season uh, starts, there is just no water left anymore. So what you do then is basically you're digging uh, um, wells and you're pumping out groundwater. What this leads to is a series of vicious cycles uh, that uh, even uh, reinforce, the, reinforce themselves. So uh, by pumping out groundwater, you're actually increasing land subsidence, which in some places is 40 centimeters per year. Just imagine, I mean, this is twice this podium, roughly the ground is uh, sinking into the ground every single year. Um, because there's urbanization and the city is growing, more gets sealed, so there's a higher, higher flood risk. There's an economic cycle as well, which of course with more flooding, there is kind of big destruction of, uh, of wealth as well. Uh, so you're having kind of this, uh, this cycle that keeps just um, reinforcing itself more and more. Um, what we did is we said we need to change course. We need to go from you know, 
okay, let's get the water out of the city back to looking at a systemic approach and uh, actually adopting a principle where we try to conserve and save as much water as possible within the city or its, uh, its surrounding. And we did this just as a sort of step water strategy, which not only lo looked at how can you deal with flooding, but also can, how can you deal with the supply side? Can we capture the water? Can we store the water? Can we distribute it in a different way? Uh, can we also reuse water, obviously? Uh, and then, in the end, also infiltrate it back into the aquifer to, uh, to kind of work with uh, uh, a fight against the line subsidence. Um, we did this with, again, uh, five different tools. Um, uh, ranging from what's called a spongy mountain terrace to dealing with channels to special um, water reservoirs for feeding the water heavy industry there uh, and then more the technical thing of recharging aquifers uh, and um, working with communities uh, on, a, on a smaller scale. I'll show you only uh, a couple of them. They're all integrated in a comprehensive uh, water master plan uh, for, for the city and the wider region. Um, two measures I just want to highlight. Um, the spongy mountain terrace basically reintroduces the idea of the rice terrace that has been used all over the place in that part of the world but had been abandoned to not only produce uh, agricultural goods but also as a water storage uh, uh, system that actually avoids the water running into, uh, into uh, the lower lying uh, parts of the city. Um, we are also looking at rechanneling the city. So this is a typical channel with concrete walls, water runs through quickly. Um, um, it has a degree of storage capacity, but not that much, into something that is, you know, not only um, slowing down water streams, which can also store more water, but also adds new qualities into the urban fabric. Uh, this is a place where you want to be, whereas the, the one before was basically just, you know, kind of the city was turning away from, uh, from the water. Now it's actually uh, turning uh, towards the water. Interestingly, um, um, we're also working on a, on a project in uh, Kazakhstan, um, which um, also comes actually as a green network, but in the end it comes down to uh, also a, a water-related strategy because water and green are so closely intertwined. When there is no green, uh, when there is no water, there is no green. Um, so um, the, the the plan to um, sort of increase and improve the green space network uh, in the region of Almaty uh, simply also starts with the idea of um, how can we make better use of the water? Because to have more green, we actually need more water. So if we want to plant more green, we also have to first deal with the supply uh, uh, of water. Um, whereas the previous one was kind of a big, you know, kind of, in a way you could say comprehensive top-down master plan. Here we're actually working with uh, a toolbox of different elements that um, are coordinated with each other, but they look at all the different typical conditions you're kind of facing along all these streams of rivers. Um, and that can be uh, implemented step by step. But it's not a sort of, let's do something here, let's do something there. There's a system behind it that over time will actually uh, establish um, uh, something that is uh, much more um, uh, powerful in a way in dealing with um, the forces of nature that are also becoming more and more uh, powerful. Um, I believe that comprehensive solutions are needed to cope simply with climate change but they also deliver, in the end, better cities because we have more green, we have lively environments, we're also protecting people in a better way from uh, uh, flooding, from drought, from heat. Um, and I think, I mean, I do this for you, I do this for me, but predominantly I actually do it for her because she's the coming generation and she actually has to deal with that uh, and the effects of climate change more than we all in this room uh, actually have. And I leave it here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Rapunzel. Very strong messages and fascinating presentation. Thank you again. Um, in the capacity of moderator, um, may I ask you, you were talking about com comprehensivity, I mean, in approach, in urban design. Uh, how we can achieve a comprehensive result and uh, um, how we can share these best practices to other cities, what is your insight in terms of knowledge sharing? Thank you. Well, um, oops. Um, I, I think, um, you know, that there is not one solution again to, to what the comprehensive plan is. What I try to show here is you can do this in a, you know, in kind of a top-down way where you work with administrations or a single administration 
uh, that um, you know kind of holds a plan and and uh, and executes it. But you can also do it in a sort of a toolbox fashion, um, which is much more you know piecemeal or incremental uh, in uh, in its development. What I think is important is that we, um, as I said, step up the game and start thinking about things in a in a in a connected way because water is also um, you know connected. It kind of finds its way, and if we you know, provide, develop something in one place, but we don't kind of look at the systemic um, uh, problem that we have, we're actually not really solving the problem. We might kind of mitigate a little situation here and there, but the systemic problem still um, uh, uh, stands. And uh, with the effects of climate change and with more and more severe weather events, um, um, it will also become more and more complicated to just you know, do these this small solutions that, that solve the problem here and there because the forces are just becoming uh, uh, too big. So I think it's important that we, that we um, uh, start um, sort of doing this in a coordinated way. And that, of course, is a big challenge for also a lot of public administrations because you're not then just working you know, with the, um, the open space uh, people or uh, uh, the utilities people or uh, people that deal with legal frameworks, you actually have to work across the sectors and overcome this, you know, these silos that uh, that uh, public administrations are uh, sort of usually working in. We see our role a bit in, in that, um, but we're also uh, sort of working and hoping for um, funding institutions. Um, um, uh, the World Bank that is doing uh, involved in this Almaty uh, uh, plan, for example, uh, or other uh, uh, investors. Uh, uh, and also political establishment to really enshrine that into legislations, into rules and regulations, and in procurement rules, that this is actually done in a, in a, in a coordinated and um, uh, concerted, uh, concerted way. When it comes to sharing, um, this plan we did for Semarang is completely in the public domain, so everybody can uh, have access to it. Uh, the Dutch government uh, paid for it, um, so um, uh, it's available on the website of uh, Water as Leverage, um, um, there is also other projects uh, in relation to water uh, that are being um, um, being published there uh, in India, in uh, um, in Colombia, and in um, in Bangladesh, where um, in parallel to us other projects have been uh, have been done. And I think sharing is really important in that because you know you don't have to reinvent the wheel um, 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 time and time again. Um, um, so that's why I believe you know these kind of things should be. Uh, in the public domain uh, anyways. Thank you very much for your comprehensive <laughs> response. Um, so, dear ladies and gentlemen, we are coming to the end of uh, panelist speakers. We have uh, had a presentation from various um, aspects of urban resilience under the umbrella of urban resilience. Uh, from a public entity inside and private companies with specific geographical contexts. So we um, try to cover different aspects of urban resilience, but this is not, of course, all. And what is also important within the case of uh, Azerbaijan is to uh, understand how we should reinforce urban resilience within the context of uh, post-war, post-conflict, situation and, uh, and the knowledge sharing is also very important. And I would like to ask um, uh, Dr. Piplas uh, to share his insights on that issue shortly. I know that you have a huge experience on that and we would like to cover also this aspect from uh, what we shall take, in, take into account in post-war conflicts and uh, uh, what we can learn from Western Europe and Switzerland, where you're coming from, uh, within the specific case of Azerbaijan. Do we have a micro, please? And then, please, the audience, we will have also questions from you. Th thank you, dear moderator, for uh, giving me the word. And I enjoyed this conversation that we're having here today and the knowledge transfer that we have to do in a sensible and sensitive way. We are, have people and experts here from all over the world. I would like to relate that to the very interesting point that you brought regarding artificial intelligence. So we speak here about 
strategic approaches and solutions, and I think it's worth to look at the production of these solutions and strategies. And artificial intelligence can help us to calculate urban form, predict traffic frequencies. It can help us calculate the buildable area verticalities. So AI is going to help us as experts save time and money. And the question is, in, in the context of what you mentioned, uh, is how can we make sure that AI doesn't produce or help us produce solution strategies that look the same, that generates before after visualizations that look the same. It nowadays can even generate project descriptions. So the threat of knowledge exchange between different regions uh, can be threatened or can be improved by AI. And I think this is something to think of. How can we use AI to really help us contextualize these urban solutions in terms of climate, in terms of culture, in terms of stakeholder inclusion. So the question back to, to the panelists, how they think about that. Anyone would like to, uh, to elaborate on that? Okay, thank you very much for your uh, uh, question. Uh, as I said before, uh, I think uh, uh, AI is a valuable tool for uh, uh, supporting planners, designers, decision makers, I mean, uh, let's say planners, and from the technical point of view, to uh, process a large amount of data, recreating, uh, let's say, analyzing historical data and creating for patches uh, or patterns, so creating, let's say, making association with different things, as you said, uh, they can help uh, uh, to help into in the design, but also in the climate changes I mentioned before, they can uh, uh, process in a lot of, uh, analyzing a lot of satellite and historical images, and immediately they can give you, let's say in a simple way, an alert, or they can give you some uh, uh, input on when, uh, let's say, if you are, uh, in which direction we are going, maybe we are consuming and we are eroding a lot of the cost. In my opinion, this is, is, the, is, the, is, the, is the threshold, so we, we, we cannot accept that AI can replace uh, uh, experts and, uh, and technicians. So in my opinion, it's useful for helping to improve in the performance, daily performance in the local administration in managing traffic routes or, or waste collection, or in the case of uh, uh, climate change, there is also some uh, solution that can help you to identify a predict basically when you will have a, a flooding base. I'll give you just an example. There is a, a MIT, for example, worked uh, another association working on identify what is the, uh, the green uh, index and also the sponginess of the cities. So if you know already how much is your city is uh, permeable, let's say in this very simple context, and then you know how much water is expecting in that time, so artificial intelligence can help you maybe to predict based on historical data if you can be in the, in the, in the let's say, in the stage or in the, uh, in the occasion or on the time to, to be flooded or no, which kind of flood. So in this case, very useful. But I'm not, uh, uh, personally, I'm not, uh, I don't see AI that can uh, uh, replace uh, expert because the, the final action, the final decision, uh, the final planning and design, as you said, also it will be uh, totally on uh, lead, led and, and, and lead by uh, experts and human experts. I mean, <laughs> thank you. Anyone would like to elaborate again? Yeah, I, I, I mean, f from my perspective, I, I don't care where the intelligence comes from as long uh, as it's intelligence, because, I mean, we're talking all about artificial intelligence. What I see so far is also a lot of artificial stupidity. Um, uh, and um, um, that's what we should avoid. Um, I, I see opportunities there. I also see problems there because in the end, you know, an AI system needs to be trained. And how do we train it? What do we train it with? Uh, and, and there I see, for example, when it comes to sort of cultural differences, to the over-representation of parts of the world in um, in publication, in uh, in the public eye, and what in, in the development of solution, where 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 there's other parts of the world, I think is is still a problem and something we need to uh, we need to for sure be conscious of, but also eventually find ways of really um, kind of being able to make these cultural adaptations. Uh, let's say that way you were referring to. 
Thank you very much. And uh, maybe last, in the continuity of the interaction with the audience, um, I would like also to give a floor for Mr. Anderson. Maybe you can elaborate on the governance aspect of urban resilience and how it's important to take this in account that we didn't cover during our uh, panel discussion. And if you have any other remark or comment, please do. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, first of all, I wanted to thank the uh, panelists for uh, very interesting uh, presentations. And uh, of course, you had um, very encouraging messages about how things can be done, which uh, clearly is much uh, appreciated. Now, at the same time, we know that the needs are enormous. And as Marcus uh, pointed out, they, 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 keep, they keep growing. There are new ones coming online. And um, we do know that in many cases, solutions are not coming about. There may be very hardworking people that have excellent ideas and still it's not possible to get this uh, put into practice. So a bit the question is if the, if the glass is half full or half empty and how we can advance, how we can scale and do more with what actually works. So I, I found, uh, I, I heard a, an interesting comment by Sipola that you said that we basically have all the tools we need then you also refer to carbon credits, as the moderator commented on. And there, are, there is a lot of criticism, in fact, around the world how carbon credits are actually working out. And it's an incredibly fragmented market where the compensation for a ton of carbon varies enormously around the world. So I, I was wondering a bit if you actually were serious when you said that you have all the tools you need and if you were really in the situation where you can scale the products in the way you would wish. And at the same time, I wanted to ask um, um, Stanley, uh, thank you for the, the work that you're doing. And I think you would like to do a lot more. So what would it take for you to take this to a different level? Where are the hurdles and how can they be overcome? Is it a lack of finance? Is it government institutions? Is it tradition? What's hindering you to do more? Because we really need to face up to the challenge and build on what, what's good and, and can work out and have more of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone would like to elaborate on that? Of Mr. Anderson's question? Um, I think I can go first. Thank you very much. Um, when it comes to implementing solutions, at first, when I started um, 2019, that was when I started my journey as an innovator and, as a, and a designer, as a young person, I thought it was finance. I actually thought you need a, a whole lot of money to solve energy problems. Then I found out that it's more than the funds. I, we have gone for implementations um, and we see that they're already pre-existing solar solutions there. But these solutions are just being pushed onto these communities, um, installing solar panels and it's left unmaintained because no one in that community has the skill to maintain that solution. And then we found that the key importance of education and some communities do not accept the solutions because of where it's possibly coming from. So there's also a political angle from providing marginalized communities access to energy. And with time, I've come to learn to listen. And the major problem, yes, you still need money. Um, in 2020, we only used around um, $20,000, or $25,000 within that range, to provide um, the 7,000 plus people direct access to energy through solar lamps, um, inverter systems. So I understood lack of money means you have to be innovative in the way the solution is deployed. You have to listen, you have to find smart ways. So finance is a big problem, but for marginalized communities, it's also the education and the political angle and the way the solution is being deployed and the training. And, but should be said, to take this to the next level would require a huge lot of finance to provide more people access to energy, but at the same time would require a lot of skill training uh, for the community and for the deployment team, because 
I myself constantly learn because these communities, we went to do a deployment, the community rejected the solution because it, it's coming from, they said it's coming from the Western world, that they don't want this in their community. What we had to do is we had to listen. It was frustrating because we already had funding, we already deployed, and they pulled off the solution, the, the street lights from the walls. We had to, it was quite frustrating. We were eating and we saw a boy playing with a toy and it had, it's a wood with cabins. We saw the same cabins around the community. So what we did is we had the community use um, wood and they carved those signs around the wood and we just put the street light into the wood and hanged it. So in that way, they feel they are part of the process, they are recognized in the process. And for me, we felt like we are smart. No, it, it, yes, we are smart to find a way to implement, but at the same time, we learned that you have to involve them from the bottom to the top of the solution, but at the same time, we still need that funding from the top to get to the bottom. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have time for another question or? So considering time that we are coming to the end of our session, I would like to thank our panelists, the audience, thank you very much for your participation, active participation, and I hope that that will be a good basis in order to continue this discussion in the future and to englobe and cover other aspects of resilience. And I would also like to thank uh, translator um, for their job. So thank you again, and uh, I would like to conclude the session. Thank you very much. Uh, it's really a very versatile topic if we talk about climate change and this panel proved it one more time. So we are moving on and to the next session. Now we're talking about technologies, the role of technologies in innovation in driving sustainable urban growth. Moderator, Ms. Leila Seyedzade from UNDP. And uh, speakers, Ms. Zaina Nazar, Mr. Eric Johnson, Mr. Royal Yolchuzade and Mr. RM Biro, the stage is yours, please. Ladies and gentlemen, the session will start in just two, three minutes.